today's guest is really, truly special, and it's a true honor and privilege to introduce um, one of my colleagues and your beloved professor, who will have a chance to share her research. I know that you are more than happy to take her classes, and you have uh, you took her class in the past, or you're taking her classes now, and she teaches you Spanish. Uh, but today, she will share with you her research on Dominican immigrants. Well, um, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Molina, Cynthia Molina, doesn't really need a thorough introduction because we all know her, but still, I would like to tell you a couple of words about her educational and academic background. Uh, Dr. Molina is the Spanish language coordinator for the foreign language division of the Fine Arts, Foreign Language, and ICS department. Dr. Molina's research um, interests and publications focus on women's issues, migration and identity, education, language and literature. She is the author of El Naturalismo and La Novela Cubana. I don't speak Spanish, <laughs> but I'll try. Yes, you can teach me something. Um, this book traces the evolution of naturalism into a literary movement in Cuba and how diverse events, political, social, and economic, contributed to create a national consciousness. She co-authored the book Perspective on Dominican Migration, which was published in 2003, which analyzes the Dominican community from transnational, global perspective. Active. Something that we need, right? Her numerous publications have appeared in peer reviewed journals and in the anthologies. This lecture will discuss the dream Dominican migrants came to fulfill in the United States, partic particularly in New York City. Immigration is more than the movement of people from one place to another, from one country to another. Immigration transforms lives because of its many implications, different challenges, characteristics, and motives. Immigration always has a common main goal, the realization of a dream. And today we will find out whether Dominican migrants who are chasing their dream, whether they actually find it and accomplish their cherished dreams. Thank you very much for that. I'm not a genius that you said I am. <laughs> 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 I want to share with you some findings, some information about Dominican. Anybody here from Dominican background? Okay, so that's interesting. If you have questions about anything that have to do with Dominicans, I'll be more happy than answer that question. Um, I um, entitled my presentation, Chasing a Dream, Dominican Migration to New York City. This that is the main idea of um, uh, immigrants. Chase that dream, the dream that we should um, accomplish. Now, here I have a map of the Dominican Republic. What do we know about the Dominican Republic? It's an island shared with another country, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. How is that relation between Haiti and the Dominican Republic? Not that, not at all. Very painful. Uh, people usually, and I have that question yesterday, asked me, uh, what is your opinion of that relationship? And I said, it's very personal. But I hope that uh, they get to a good agreement. Uh, between the two countries. Okay. So that is one of the main characteristics of that uh, uh, 
country. The Dominican Republic has 11 million people, it's the population, 11 million, but two million live outside the Dominican Republic. It's a country overpopulated, I, I'll say. It's a country that is moving very fast, economically, technologically, and in other areas. But uh, the population is not benefiting from that. Why? Because of bad administration. Uh, the Dominican Republic has a GDP of $85 billion. $6.1 billion is sent from immigrants. Okay? And uh, I will say if there are the, um, 2 million Dominicans living abroad and the Dominican Republic receives 6.1 billion from abroad, how much is receiving from the United States specifically? Okay? So those are things that we have to uh, question. And all this information comes from the uh, International Monetary Fund. Now, how best describe the Dominican Republic than reading a poem by the national poet, Pedro Mi. And that poem was translated recently by the great translator and poet, a New Yorker, Jonathan Cohen, and the director of the Modern Language Association, Donald Walsh. It is a translation, the title of the poem is Hay un país en el mundo, in Spanish. The translation, a country in the world. But what is this? There is a country in the world, situated right in the sun's path, in the native of the night in an improbable archipelago of sugar and alcohol, simply light, like a bat's wing, leaning on the breeze, simple, bright, like the trace of a kiss on an elderly man. That is the Dominican Republic. Okay? Described by the poet. National poet. I have this. You you might see that I have things that I I do myself because I like it. I don't like the number one, two, three, and four. I start always with number five. It's my lucky number. Mm -hmm. So I do that. Now the migration, the Dominican migration, has three moments. And I will explain. The relationship between the Dominican Republic and the United States has been sweet and sour. Why? Because that relationship has been based upon economic and political domination. And people don't like to be dominated. So that's the reason it's become sour. So we can watch. The United States has always been involved in Latin American affairs, and we see that 1916 to 1924 was no exception. At that time, we had our eyes set on the Dominican Republic. During this time period, we occupied and governed the Dominican Republic, and our presidents were Woodrow Wilson, who served two terms and was in office until 1921, and then following him, Warren G. Hardin, who tragically died during his first term due to a severe heart attack. 
the United States' main reason for occupying the Dominican Republic was purely economic. It was due to the unstable political situation which was causing a delay in repayment of debts to the United States and other countries. Although the occupation was for the advancement of the economy, it was actually quite unpopular with Americans because they felt it was a complete waste of money. Due to the occupation, the Dominican economy was strangled as the United States forcibly collected debts owed to them. And due to this, the United States and the Dominican Republic created a deal that the United States would withdraw and Dominican customs would be used to pay long-standing debts. After we left, the Dominican Republic did in fact remain stable, but it wasn't long before another dictator took over. In some cases, the Dominican Republic resented the United States for all their involvement, but overall the relationship between the two countries is not bad. understand, you have an idea what, what is the problem, what is that uh, sour relationship. What was the interest of the United States in the Dominican Republic? Well, the Dominican Republic um, has what other countries in the Caribbean area, including Cuba, does not have. Excellent minerals, excellent agriculture, and strategically located, okay? And a population that at that time, I will say between the 1940s and the 1970s was extremely well educated. Those were factors that uh, called the attention of the United States, but one main factor was the production of sugar cane. Okay. So, now, three moments that determined the migration of Dominica to the United States. 1960, 1965, 1970 to 1980, it's a great moment for Dominicans in the United States, particularly in New York, and the 1990 to the present. 1990 is the evolution of the Dominican uh, migrants. Now, 1960-1970. In 1961, Rafael Trujillo Molina was killed. No relation with me. <laughs> After 30 years of brutal ruling, when I say brutal ruling, I mean brutal ruling, okay? Uh, during his government, Dominican citizens were not allowed to leave the country. And if they leave, they were considered traitors. There were so many restrictions for people to leave, even to go on conferences, uh, just to go and visit family, it was impossible. When one person I note, my father left the Dominican Republic in 1952. Why? Because he graduated from the university and he said that he will not shake hands with the dictator. And he left. Okay? So that was one of, the, of one of the main problems, that people that left never returned. They couldn't return. Another restriction was the cost of the passport. At that time, the Dominican peso was at the same level as the dollar. A dollar was a Dominican peso. There was no devaluate uh, currency at that time. So that makes it hard to accumulate, I don't know, $200 to get a passport? It was hard. But people, middle class people, left the country and they never returned. So, but Trujillo death precipitated changes at the economic, social, and political level. 
it was a country in distress after he, he, he passed. Um, the economy was so chaotic that that caused a crisis, a crisis of major proportion. And that was the main motive for upper and middle class people dissatisfied with the situation to leave. They left the Dominican Republic to different countries, Mexico, Venezuela was a great recipient of Dominicans, apart the United States. But they left with the idea of returning. But that never happened. Now, what happened by 1963-1964? A lot of changes were happening in Latin America. Changes in Cuba, radical changes in Cuba. So all those changes in a way affected the entire Latin America and the Dominican Republic was not an exception. So uh, young people and uh, university students, they got influence and they revolt against the government in power. That was not longer Trujillo, it was a military junta by then. Right? So uh, one of the main events of those years was the revolt of 1965. People in the Dominican Republic revolt against the government. And this is known as the revolt, the April revolt of 1965. But what happened? That was on the 24th of April. But the 28th of April, what happened? The United States intervened. and everything was finished. All those rebels, most of them were killed, some of them were imprisoned, but the revolt was eliminated, okay? So, um, what were the consequences of all that? Because uh, the country was now well by then, so, what happened is that the United States imposed the government of the conservative Joaquin Balaguer. And Joaquin Balaguer governed for 12 years. And he came back. After 12 years, he came back <laughs> and uh, he gave rule to another uh, political party that didn't do well by them, but it was with the uh, support of the United States, okay? Now, what happened in 1965? 1965 and the April Revolt marked the beginning of massive migrations of Dominican people. Massive migrations. They were living poof, by the hundred, by the thousand. And the United States was one of the main port. Upper middle class, professionals, university students, they left the country massively. And many of them settled down in New York City. Brooklyn was, was, was one of the first uh, community of Dominicans here in the city. Okay. Now, according to the um, Immigration Naturalization Service of 2003, between 1961 and 1970, there were 93,000 Dominicans living in New York City, only. How that happened? Well, people left. So the decades that follow experience um, an increase in Dominican migration uh, to the United States, not only to New York, but to other areas like Boston, and later uh, Florida. During the 70s, the dream 
once again to return. But they would, um, they have that desire to return. But they came like a, like I call it, like with a bag full of dreams. I remember because I was here in the 70s. So I remember those dreams. Oh, I'm coming. I'm going to be here for six months. Then I return back and I'll be fine. But that never happened. So those dreams never happened. They couldn't accomplish them. Okay? So uh, what were the dreams? I characterize them as this. Dreams of returning. Dreams of returning rich and powerful dreams of making it in New York. I don't know how many make it. Many did, but I am not so sure. So, during the 70s, the Dominican Republic fell to restructure the economic and the political uh, structure of the country. Those promised that Balaguer did to the United States and to the Dominican people fail, and the country uh, fell into a climate of political repression and a devastated economy. That were the 70s in the Dominican Republic. So these two factors, again, precipitated the migration of entire family now. Now is not an individual living but entire family, and that was painful. A lot of young Dominicans, they decided to leave. How were they leaving any way they could? Taking a, uh, a boat and going into Puerto Rico by boat. That started in the 70s. And then from Puerto Rico, taking a plane and landing in New York. That was the way people were desperate by then. Okay. So they wanted to escape. It was cruel to leave there. There was no food. There was no social or political instability. A lot of repression. The Balaguer government was a very repressive government. Okay. So um, many of these youngsters that came from the Dominican Republic in the 70s um, were educated in the United States, and they became professionals in different fields. They became educators, they became lawyers, doctors, etc., etc. Okay? It was interesting to see that, um, that group of Dominicans that came in the 70s as young, uh, as young people. Okay? So, um, In 1980, 1990, it is all known as the lost decade. Again, <laughs> that economy never was never fixed. It was always in bad shape. Okay, but it was not only in the Dominican Republic. The Dominican economy was greatly affected but it was affected by the Latin American debt crisis of that, that, of that decade. So, because it was so in poor shape, <coughs> uh, the Dominican Republic failed to uh, meet the International Monetary Fund's conditions, and the outcomes of that was devastated. So what happened? Inflation went out of control. The currency was totally devalued. And that happened for the third time. This was the third time that the currency was devalued. And then the country was in the brink of a bankruptcy. Okay? So it was a total, total disaster. Um, I remember uh, going uh, to the Dominican Republic during those years, and uh, I couldn't recognize the country. I never saw the country so impoverished as I saw it during the 1980s. 
She said yes. Just, just, if you talk to your parents, they might say the same thing that I'm saying. I never saw the country uh, the way I saw it during those years. I graduated in 1980, and uh, I remember I went on vacation, and I couldn't believe what I saw. There was no water, there was no electricity. Um, a fool was very sparse. It, it, it was it was a disaster. Um, the fuel was very expensive, so the taxis couldn't work. The the buses, transportation was a disaster. You go to the supermarket, everything was so expensive, and uh, you couldn't find anything. Even in the hotels, it, it was it was it was awful. So that was that was the the situation then. So um, what happened when the economy goes so bad that people are forced to leave to look for a better life and acceptable living standards? And this is part of what people said to me when I do my interview. We want better living standard. That's what we are looking for, you know. We don't want, not, we just want decent uh, living standard. So, full of dreams, again, they left the country by the hundred and then by the thousands. Uh, there was a day that 15,000 Dominicans arrived at Kennedy. And we were saying, how they arrived? How that happened? I do not believe it. Honestly, I do not believe it. But people swear for that. I says if you tell me that in a week or two weeks, I might say okay. But that's what they say. So let's see what happened. So the following decades characterized by a constant flow of Dominican migrants to different geographical parts, sharing the dreams of earlier migrants, a rapid return. Again, they keep with that. I'm going back. I just come for uh, a while. Work, make some money, and I go back and I open a business. There's no condition for business in the Dominican Republic. So what happened that they have to stay here? But the 1980s have been significant for Dominican migration. Yes. More than a quarter million were legally admitted to the United States during that time. And that is important. But there is another thing that is even more important than that. Even though these migrants were poor because of the condition of the country, Many were now very well educated, but there were also professionals. But the 1980s, <laughs> one of the factors that called my attention was the, this particular, uh, particular group of migrants, Dominican women. Hmm. They came by numbers, okay? That never happened before. Historically, they migrated, but in small number. But in the 1980s, whew, a large number of Dominican women left the country, again, in search of a dream, a better life for their family. And they came by themselves. Now, as a family, they came, they, they came by themselves. So according to the Migration Policy Institute, in the 1980, more than half of all Dominican immigrants residing in the United States have been female. And this is from <coughs> last year, April 2018. Unbelievable, right? So that never happened. But there is another, um, another uh, data that is important in relation to women. Dominican women. Dominican women are very special in a way. Now, uh, what happened nowadays, today? 1990-2000. What is what's going on today? Okay. Well, 
Today, 1.9 million Dominicans reside in the United States. In New York, 609,000, probably more. This is legally people that we can count, okay? So we don't know exactly how many reside in New York City. So, so data. Dominicans in New York City are the largest Hispanic group and the largest Dominican population outside the Dominican Republic. And within the minority groups, Dominicans are So even though the Dominican community is considered poor, uneducated, and lacking professionals, as a young community in the city, it has contributed to the culture, the economy, and the politics of greater New York and the country, per se. How? So I let you know. Contribution to culture, important Dominican artists such as Teresa de Garcia and Moses Ross have put the Dominican artistic community in the map of the United States and also globally. We, Susana and I and Daniel are so proud that we have Cherezada in our department for a long time. She's no longer here. She went to uh, Parson and she, uh, she teaches there. She has a, uh, she's, she's one of those artists that has a permanent um, uh, exhibition at the Smithsonian Museum. Moses Ross, also an architect. Well, Moses was born and raised here in New York. Uh, his parents came in the 70s. His, his brilliant uh, uh, painter, and uh, he, he, he uh, used recycled material for his uh, <coughs> work. So, Estrella Sada is more involved into uh, creating uh, the migration life of people. She's always looking for those ideas. How do we migrate? What is in our mind? What we are looking when we, as migrants, what do we do? Okay, and how we arrive here. So it's always that is that she has that in mind. Look at this. Uh, the plane, the, you know, coming from here to there, blah, 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 blah. So you got that idea. So those are two important artists. Uh, in terms of literature, big contribution also from Dominicans, writers like you know Diaz, Pulitzer Prize winner, and Julia Alvarez introduced the Latino-Hispanic literary dialogue to the mainstream American canon. And also, uh, we could see in both writers their interest on migration and the uh, reality of immigrants. Uh, in Julia Alvarez, uh, you might know her uh, novel, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent. So that is uh, that struggle with the identity, with Dominican and the American identity. How do they negotiate those two identities? But again, she talks about um, how uh, a family, a middle class family, have to leave the country because they were against the dictator. And they arrived here in New York and uh, how life was. Uh, you know, Diaz is a different, uh, uh, has a different style, and he deals more with uh, the reality of poor people in the ghettos. Right? Now, New York is the space for Dominican art. Why I said that? Well. Because um, in Washington Heights, where there is the uh, main uh, Dominican community, uh, there are 
10 art galleries, okay, Dominican art galleries, uh, including Rios, uh, Rios 1, 2, and 3, three galleries dedicated to uh, art. But it's not only Dominican artists that exhibit there, it's open to all other artists. There is a theater, the Theater People Project, Mino Lora, who was a former student of us here, she opened a theater and is becoming very popular and good. Her uh, mission is to change the world through theater. Okay? And uh, uh, concert halls, uh, now they have the uh, Karamata, and is again a former student of mine, Adam Vasquez, directing this uh, space. And uh, they have festivals, uh, like the Boulevard, El Festival del Boulevard, where the, they uh, uh, bring all sort of artists from the Dominican Republic and also from other areas. Main contribution to the culture of the city. Uh, in 1992, the CUNY Dominican Institute was founded by a group of professors uh, and uh, business people. So the CUNY Dominican Institute is a research institution uh, and the main mission is to study uh, Dominicans in the United States and abroad and also Dominicans in the Dominican Republic. La Casa de la Cultura Dominicana is another cultural center where the annual Dominican Book Fair takes place. So La Casa uh, organized monthly activities to promote and support Dominican artists, Dominican dialogue, Dominican discussion, uh, Dominican business, everything else. So Dominican community organizations are means to maintain and preserve the culture. There are right now more than 400 Dominican organizations, and I'm working on a project. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Melissa is not here. Uh, one of my students that is assisting me with this project. There are so many cultural organizations that is seeking. We cannot cope with that, the many. And all of them have something in mind. Help immigrants. Attract immigrants and help them. So, the, all these Dominican organizations celebrated 60 years yesterday. Now, the contribution of Dominican to the economy, well, Dominican owned more than 9,000 9, businesses in New York City by 1988. That has tripled, that number has tripled according to uh, the Migration Policy Institute. Today, they said more than 30,000? I'm not sure, this is what they say. And these numbers are from uh, 2016. But this is what they own. We have a state, medical center, supermarkets, restaurant, and many more. Now, remember what I told you about and interesting data, look at this. Dominican women are also entrepreneurial, owning almost 25% of all business owned by Dominican. Again, 2016. Okay. Look at this. This is in Washington Heights. Furniture, uh, chicharron, your name. All sort of business. Entrepreneurial. Okay. In the area of politics, what is the contribution of Dominican politics? Well, the first uh, Dominican councilman, Guillermo Linares, was elected in 1991. And Guillermo has called various political polls, such as State Assembly and Commissioner of the Major's Office of Immigrant Affairs from 2004 to 2009. Adriano Espaillat is a congressman representing the 13th Congressional District. And Tomas Perez 
was the Labor Secretary under the Obama's administration. And Perez is now the chair of the Democratic National Committee. Other elected officials are in Brooklyn and Queens, Staten Island, and Bronx, uh, but these two are from Washington Heights. Idanis Rodriguez and Marisol Alcantara. And by now I ask, where the dreams have gone with all this? Well, let's find out. What happened with the new generation born and raised in the United States? They are not interested in going to the Dominican Republic. They don't care. They, they don't want to do that. But they have culturally influenced Dominicans residing in the island. Many of them are professional, they speak English, and have a better standard of living. Conditions that young Dominicans from the island aspire to. Why not? The dream to return is no longer a priority. Today's dream is to settle here and be successful. While, keep, while keeping national network with the Dominican Republic and leaving the duality of being here and also there. As trans migrants from here to there, from there to here, okay? In the process to realize their dreams, Dominicans have crossed diverse social and cultural boundaries and trying together the values of local, national, and global traditions, thus becoming trans migrants and transnationals. Taking, leaving, taking, leaving. Moreover, their transcultural nature has allowed them to develop a broader cultural identity that rearticulates their Dominicanidad or Dominicanness. So what do they do in order to rearticulate that? By doing that, by negotiating that identity, what happened to the dreams? They fade. And there is no more dream. The only dream is to come and stay. And that is the reality of the Dominican community. Thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> do we have any questions? Yes. Questions? Zoe, please. Um, <coughs> you mentioned uh, that you were doing a project with a student here. Can you elaborate more on that? The projects on the uh, community, the organ oh, okay, it's a project that was funded by uh, Idani Rodriguez, the councilman from Inwood, Washington Heights. And uh, uh, the project is to create a directory of organizations, Dominican organizations. Uh, and what do they do? How to uh, assess them in terms of the service that they do to the community? And uh, because the community also is not only Dominicans, it has a lot of Mexicans and uh, Peruvian now and some other. So they, they are the bringing together that community also because he himself has to serve them too. So it's a very, uh, in a way, political project. We have been working on that. Are you Dominican? No? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's only, um, it's Inwood, Washington Heights, and Hamilton Heights. Those are the three neighborhoods that the project is uh, serving. You could give another complete talk on the whole island and discuss the Haitians and the Dominicans, but I won't ask you to get into that. <laughs> we did have a Haitian who came here a few years ago and discussed that to the handles about that. So that's another, you could have another uh, person talk. The only thing I won't I ask you to discuss it. No, the only thing I could say is, and uh, this is not for nothing, but uh, that situation is so painful between that relationship is painful. And uh, um, my brother and I inherited such a huge 
you know that. Such a huge piece of land that is right in the border with Haiti. And um, when my father was alive, he, he said, no, they allow those people from, from Haiti to stay there. So they, take, they took care of that land. And uh, my father says, let them build houses, whatever, you know. And uh, before he died, um, he, he, he says something like, uh, you have to protect those people. You are not going back there. You have to protect those people. So what we decided was to donate that land to these people. That's what we did. We also helped many of them to build their houses. So we have been trying with the government uh, for them to build like a school or the hospital, or just a small tent that they have some medical service. But uh, there is no way, we are not successful with it. None of the government. We have very, um, we have hope with Leonel Fernandez, but uh, he was like any other. There's no hope. I don't know whether you have any economic data on the situation of Dominicans, either in New York City or in the country. You know, I mean, things like average family income. Uh, the number of families where they have two parents or the number of parents, things like this. Well, according to the <laughs> the uh, the World Bank, Dominicans here have a salary of thirty-seven thousand. Okay. While in the Dominican Republic, let's say it will be maybe twenty thousand. Okay. But 20,000 are in the Dominican Republic. I don't know how that is translated. But 37,000 here, how could you leave with uh, 37,000 and be able to send money to the Dominican Republic? So for me, those numbers don't make sense. Are you saying they are wrong? Why are you saying uh, it's hard for me to imagine how uh, people can It is survive. hard for me, yes. It is hard for me to imagine how they so The Dominican Republic is not an inexpensive country. It's very expensive. Now that's 37,000 individual salary, median salary, or is it's it median salary for a family or individual? It's individual, but there are a family that the only provider is the man, mm -hmm. and with uh, 37,000, I, I don't know. And they may participate in the formal economy as well. Probably, mm -hmm. yes. Because to be able to send $6.1 billion to the country. To participate in the formal yes. economy. It is very hard for me to. Other questions? Other questions? Yes. I have one. I did read an, uh, a chapter on Dominican immigrants, and the emphasis of that chapter was that many families, Dominican families in this country, are basically women oriented. So that may or may not be a permanent husband, and that also the exchange between what goes on here in the Dominican community and what goes on back there, that there's a lot of going back and forth. Yeah. For instance, daughters, if they don't behave, they're sent back, you know, quote, behave, and so on and so on. Is that true? Yeah, well, yes. Th that's the reason I use the word transmigrant. Right. Because so that is what they are doing, you know, the influence. Uh, they don't want to be there. But and when and then another another thing is you if when they are there they don't feel like they belong. They want to be here, but when they are here they don't they feel that they don't belong either. You know. So but yes, that is true. It's a lot of traveling back and forth, back and forth. 
even I um, I interviewed somebody last week that uh, this person has a 10 years visa, comes here, spend three months, go goes back. After let's say six months, comes here, stay three months, and go back. And I said, what did you do when you were here? He said, um, I work. Where do you work? I work in a restaurant. And what did you do when you are in the Dominican Republic? I work. I says, where do you work? In my restaurant. So how can I, <laughs> you know, it's very difficult. This is, this is a lot of money. Thank you. So um, our college is very much engaged with the Dominican Republic. I was there about a month ago. We are recruiting students from there to come here, and we are hoping that we can develop national talent. They, they go back. We have forged a relationship with the uh, Global Foundation for uh, development in, and democracy, which was founded by the former president, Leonel uh, Fernandez, that you talked about. And, uh, and we are also offering our students an opportunity to do study abroad internship during the summer in Santo Domingo. It's for eight weeks, and you are placed in a leading organization or company or governmental agency and um, half of it is covered by scholarship. Uh, the flyer is on the wall in the hallway and you can pick it up in my office if you're interested. Uh, so um, some of the leading majors that they're offering is sports management, uh, political science, finance, banking. Um, so, and we value those linkages. And one thing that you mentioned that is very important, Dominicans in need of have political muscle, they have been organized. And, uh, and then you go back to, you know, I wasn't there for about 10, 15 years, and I went back to Islam. It is developing, it is taking off. Unfortunately, the history that you gave was during the Cold War, uh, this kind of anti-communism orientation of the US also shaped that island, or it is taking off, and the young people are especially female, uh, females are uh, yeah. good presentation. It's, it's, it's growing fast. Look, the Dominican Republic um, in the 1960 uh, was practically developed in comparison with other countries. And like I said, it has a uh, such a good economy because, and this is one of the things, Trujillo, <laughs> Trujillo, who nationalized all the industries in the country, and that was one of the things that the United States did not like, it, that he nationalized everything. So he made sure that the Dominican Republic was steady economically. That's what he wanted. But he did not want anybody to go against him. So that was that was a problem. And that he wanted to stay. And the people that were not uh, satisfied with the government and they were leaving, uh, he did this. So he all sent people to kill um, people here in the United States. You know, that, that was a problem. But the Dominican Republic was a uh, economically, it was in excellent shape. Uh, the Dominican Republic has an excellent um, sugar industry. <laughs> excellent sugar industry. <coughs> excellent um, the industry to make um, bolt chips. They had that. It was the gun industry in the Dominican. It was the only one in Latin America, I think. Uh, the 
Our communication was excellent. The telephone was one of the best. It is very hard that you don't get communicated to, uh, to the Dominican Republic. Not today with the internet. Everywhere you go, you find the internet. Not in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Not in Puerto Rico. The industry, and that is a new industry now. The, the hotel industry is new, practically new. Other industry, oil, um, and then cooking oil, gas, this, you name it. And then also benefited from all these companies that from the United States, Canada, England, and uh, Poland that came to the Dominican Republic and they opened business there. But Trujillo was very smart. Now, like the, uh, the government that came after him. I'm not a Trujillo fan, please. <laughs> not at all, I'm not. So she did a lot to my family and to my father. Okay, Dr. Molina, thank you so much. It's been <laughs> today. If you want to find out more about Dominican Republic and Dominican immigrants, you may enroll in our new course of um, Immigrant New York, which will be offered by the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice next fall. Okay?